the epistle upon to be read for this, the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany, or the 27th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brethren, we give thanks to God always for you all, continually making a remembrance of you in our prayers, being mindful before God and our Father of your work of faith and labor and charity and your enduring hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, brethren, beloved of, beloved of God, how you were chosen. For our gospel was not delivered to you in word only, but in power also, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much fullness, as indeed you know what manner of men we have been among you for your sakes. And you became our imitators of us and of our Lord, receiving the word in great tribulation, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became a pattern to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For from you the word of the Lord has been spread abroad, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith in God has gone forth, so that we need say nothing further. For they themselves report concerning us how we entered among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to await from heaven Jesus, his Son, whom he raised from the dead who has delivered us from the wrath to come. And the Holy Gospel <clears throat> is taken from St. Matthew in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At that time, Jesus spoke this parable to the crowds. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. This, indeed, is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it grows up, it is larger than any herb and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and dwell in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and buried in three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and without parables he did not speak to them, that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Thus for this Sunday's Holy Gospel. My beloved people, Things uh, this morning are a little bit uh, different. Uh, it seems that on every Sunday morning, I have to have something to go haywire. And this has been going on for several months now. And uh, it's beginning to appear to me rather pointedly that somehow or other, and I have this impression very well imprinted on me, that the devil does not like this mass. And that's about the only thing that I can assess of it, because there's too much to militate against this mass on Sunday morning in this church. So with God's help, nevertheless, there will be mass here in this church, the devil to the contrary notwithstanding, at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning and let him go back to his abode and swim around in his fire. We will come here, my beloved people, and give worship to God every Sunday morning. And one way or another, we will have mass on Sunday morning. 
so be it. In the name of the Father, and Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. We are about to start our preparations for Advent because the season of Advent is upon us. Next week is the final Sunday after Pentecost when we will read the usual gospel together concerning the desolation at the end of time. There are several various little devotions that we have that I encourage you to go forth in and to present these little devotions to your children. Uh, the first one, of course, as we can start getting ready for it now, is the Advent wreath. The Advent wreath should be on your principal table in, the, in your house, in your home. And the Father, I always, in, I always insist upon Father, will bless the wreath and the devotion will go on from there. Also, we will start during Advent a uh, little devotion with the blessed wheat. And we will describe that as we arrive to each of these individual uh, points. Dear people, I have said to you before, and I repeat it for emphasis, another firm conviction of mine. And that is that we today have the misfortune of living in times that I consider to be far worse than they were before the flood. And whereas we don't want to put ourselves in the position of when is this going to happen, or what day of the month, or what day of the week, or when, or what year, we don't know. But it does appear very, very definitely that we are on the path to something. What must we do to be prepared? The first thing, the first before all things, is the state of grace. That we have to work on the state of grace in our soul, the condition of our souls. After that is taken care of, we need worry about nothing further. In the thought to remember today, this is talked about. A man in the state of grace can turn all things into that which pertains to God. A man who is not in the state of grace, no matter what he does, it is dead. The world today does not comprehend the state of grace. The world today does not comprehend grace. The world today places no importance whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the world today does not take the time to place importance on God. God is not, is not even worth thinking about today. And you know it. At least before the flood, they believed in something. It was pagan, it was wrong, but they did have enough of walking sense to be convinced of the existence of something that they had a difficulty in understanding. Some of them, and many of them, most of them, all of them apparently, turn to the golden calf and to this and to that and the other, the, the tree and so forth. 
And God could only find one family, one family alone, that was in a condition of mind and soul to carry on the work of his creation. We are so close to that today, beloved people, aren't we? They, in those days, at least believed in something. Today, dear people, they don't believe in anything except themselves. They are completely filled with self to the complete exclusion of God. But God is working, isn't he? And he will bring us to our knees and we will have to, you, we here, will have to suffer. We are the ones that are gonna be called upon to save what there's left of the church, of the religion, of the belief, of the life of grace, the life of Jesus Christ. And we will have to be willing to give of that to him. We must confirm our love in him at every moment of every day. We must confirm that love in Jesus Christ. We must make our offering of suffering. Which one of you, which one of us, is not being asked to suffer? And I will tell you this, that the more you ask to love God, Christ, the more like unto Christ you will become, the more you will be asked to suffer. And I ask you to examine carefully your thoughts that in this suffering, regardless of what it may be, that you will give that suffering at least joyfully. It will be painful but give it joyfully. Give it with peace in your hearts. And that will make an offering. It will be joined on. Our blessed Lord, our blessed Lord suffered violently. We do not know how violently, but we do know he suffered violently hanging on the cross. But was there ever an instant in those hours that he suffered for the beginning of his agony to his death, was there ever a single moment where he demonstrated lack of peace, lack of serenity, lack of joy, lack of goodness? And this is what he is asking of us, that we suffer because we love. He suffered because he loved. And his greatest suffering, of course, was, as we know, as he looked about from the heights of that little mountain and raised up high on that cross, he looked down the ages and he saw the countless numbers of men and women and children who would not take advantage of what he had been, what he was doing, and that they were lost. We cannot afford that tragedy to come to us. So, in this season of Advent, I do not ask or suggest that we do anything out of ordinary. We continue to do it, but. In, 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 a condition, in a condition of love, sacrifice, and what I'm asking for ourselves the season of Advent. Lent is not of the uh, emphasis. Lent is 
but it is penance. It is a slayer. It is, it is a season of preparation. It's a season of expectation. And each Sunday, each Sunday in the reading of the Gospels and the Epistles, we're brought just that much closer to the moment of expectation when it all takes place. The world outside, as we all know, is not interested in that business of penance. It's too busy in its materialistic uh, endeavors. It's only interested in the material part of it all. We must be interested only in the spiritual. That there are some material preparations for the Feast of Christmas, we have to take care of that. As I mentioned to a certain visiting priest just this past week, we must be very careful, very cautious, especially those of us who have small children. You know, the world, before the day of Christmas, is full of excitement, is full of preparation, it's full of shopping and shopping and shopping and getting boxes and getting presents and getting up this and decorating and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All getting ready for Christmas. There are those of us who are against this because we look at Advent as being a time of penance. Therefore, our house, our homes have to be, drafted, have to be draped in, in purple as it were, a gloom, as it were. And our little children who do, not, who do not understand and who see the world in all of its excitement, they can't help but see it. But in our homes, it's not there. Then the day of Christmas arrives. Do I need to tell you or remind you that as you drive down the boulevard on Christmas Day, how many places do you find the Christmas tree already in the gutter? And our children are watching. The day after Christmas and the time after Christmas, Christmas is finished on the day itself. And our little children are watching. And they say, we've been robbed of something. Before Christmas, we can't do anything because it's penance. And after Christmas, there's nobody to celebrate it with us. Something is missing. Our little children are watching. And there is a void created there. And as you know, this void is filled. It has to be filled because nature abhors a vacuum. Our little children are watching. And in the place of the little customs of, of tradition, whatever they are, they find these gargoyles, monsters with big teeth, ugly things, and the space that is created, the void that is created, is filled by this void. And our little children are watching. And when they grow up, they will not know anything. As we, I ask you, dear people, as we get closer and closer, to the day itself, and it is the central day. It is the day that heavens, the foot of heaven, 
the tiny feet of the baby touched this earth. What could be more important than that? The only thing I ask of us all is that as we approach this great occasion and as we see the way things are handled in our present day culture, our present day mentality, our present day whatever, that we look upon this occasion with good and honest common sense for our own sake and for the sake of our little children who are watching. And you know well enough, you older ones, you can go back to the earliest days of your lives and you can remember what took place when you were a tiny child. And that which was brought upon you and put upon you when you were that tiny child, beloved people, in honesty, is that not still in your memory bank? Of course it is. There's no way on earth that you can forget that. And you have been, and that has formed you to thinking the way you think. Because when you were a little child, you too were watching and learning and remembering. Therefore, as we approach these, this wonderful occasion of the birth of our Lord, of course that is the central character, the central feature of this entire period. That comes first. And the little children have to know that that comes first. But other preparations that might be, or other customs that the family might have, they must somehow, must somehow be brought into conformity with this one central occasion when the second person of the Blessed Trinity touched this earth with his, his little feet. The church has always, the church knows what it is about. Our church has centuries of experience. In the early days that Christ was born on the 25th day of December, uh, that is not an established fact. We cannot prove that. We do not know that he was or was not born on that particular day. But as we look back on history, the pages of history, that particular day, the 25th day of December, was the most pagan, most God-forsaken day of the entire year. And that day was surrounded by lights and presents, etc., and debauchery and drunkenness and women and everything you can think of. Ugliness all over the place that particular day. The church at that time was unable to do anything about it except one thing. And look what the church did. It did not go out and scream this and scream that and scream the other thing. The church simply took the baby Jesus and placed him right on top of the most pagan day of the entire year. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? And many other occasions, as we study the pages, read the pages of history, we see where the church simply 
put alongside pagan customs its own customs. And now we have where the people are watching and are learning and are imitating. Small numbers they were perhaps. We are small numbers. But we must do what we can in order to hang on, to hold on to whatever we can that will keep this whole program of Jesus Christ on earth with all of its sincerity, with all of its brilliance, with all of its importance. We have to do it one way or another. You have to do it. And together we have to do it using common sense, remembering always and always our children are watching. We cannot force our children. We must not try to force our children because we will lose them. Yes, we will. We cannot force our children. We must lead them by our own common sense, by our own good example. Our epistle this morning by St. Paul, does he not speak of that very thing? Our example, the leaven, our Lord himself spoke of the leaven. Our Lord himself spoke, spoke of the mustard seed. We are the mustard seed. We are the leaven. And we are expected to do these things in the most right way, it's the only word I can think of, the most correct way possible. As our children will pick this up and carry it with them through life, they will be the older ones in days to come. And they will be, they, our children, will be what our parents made of them to be. These are dreadful words. Our children will be what our parents have made of them to be. This is not to say that our parents would in all cases be guilty of neglect or whatever you want to, however you want to say it or put it. I didn't say that. I didn't mean that. I didn't think that. But I am saying that with proper guidance and proper example, there our parents will in every case, in somehow or other, plant that seed. You will plant that seed as we give you the little grains of wheat in the next few days. You will show your children, and I point to the fathers, forgive me fathers, forgive me gentlemen, but you're the ones, you're the ones. Our civilization depends on you. Yes, the mother, the hand that rocks the cradle, we know that. But the example of the man, the example of the man who will put aside his pride, his arrogance, his whatever, the example of the man who will come down on his knees, not telling his child, get down on your knees, forcing his child, get down on your knees, boy. Do what I'm doing, boy. Not that, not that at all. But that the father will be on his knees and his children as they pass by, are watching, are watching. And they will see their father, and beside him, their mother. And they will wonder, and they will think, 
and they will see where beauty really exists. They're watching. And this is what we have to show our children and teach our children. They will grow up with that and they will stay with that the rest of their lives. And the image of their father kneeling in silent prayer and the image of their mother kneeling next to him in silent prayer, that image will be carved in granite and no force on this earth will be able to change that image. Beloved people, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm aiming at. We have to do that for, the, for ourselves, of course, first and foremost, to save our own souls. But we have to give the example. We have to make an image, create an image for our children to see. Where else, or what else rather, what else are our children able to see today that is Christ-like? Would you tell me? Where are they going to see Christ in anything, anywhere, anyhow, any place? Where can they see Christ? They can only see Christ in those two simple, and I use the word simple in its beautiful definition. Our Lord was simple. Those children have only the example of their simple, good, and priceless parents kneeling together. And those children, if they see that enough, one by one, they will join mother and father. And their prayer, all of them together, will go up to God together. And he will hear the prayer of that family. There's a lot that can't be put into this package that I'm speaking about. Excuse me for using that term. But uh, there's very little that we can find. And as we look about our own situations, we see things that are not right. Don't, don't, don't consider yourselves guilty. This happened in the flash of a moment and it crumbled. And we are still in the process of living with that crumble. Do not be afraid. I must not be afraid. These monks and nuns must not be afraid. We must go on with what we are doing for the sake of Jesus Christ. There is no other reason. Everything, it's, 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 it's in our bulletin today. The world was made for prayer. Go tell that to the birds as far as the world is concerned today. But the world was made for prayer, for worship and honor and glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And you, precious people, are being called upon to carry that out. That's your duty. Above all else, that's your duty. That's our duty. <laughs>